decided to go for this very, very short title because it's a title that tries to incorporate as much ideas as possible. And I tried to draw um, vocabulary from essentially two fields. I mean, in the, the term setting uh, actually, as um, perhaps as some of you know, is, uh, is a technical term that was actually invented by one of the psychonauts or one of my our most celebrated psychedelic gurus. And I will also go into the explanation of what that means in a second, which defines the location in which the trip experience or the psychedelic experience should take place. Usually the term is setting is not used exclusively for religious contexts. It is just the place in which this thing occurs. And if, for example, we were to talk about marijuana as a psychedelic use, frequently the setting has nothing to do with religious contexts, but it has to do perhaps with um, a back alley or the forest or just as soon as before someone is going out into the, to the cinema or is just in the middle of the street, which is very different, for example, ideal settings for MDMA or LSD. Sacred was because I wanted to stress the religious and spiritual element of the use of psychedelics, which is essentially what I'm going to go and talk about now. So what are psychonauts? This is a term that was actually created in um, 1948, and the first designation of the term psychonaut actually had to do with the navigator of the soul, or people who use various systems or technologies to actually navigate the soul or the mind, it really depends on the school of thinking because there are multiple schools of thinking, personal interpretation and empirical experimentation within the entheogenic uh, perspective of psychedelic use. Um, and it had to do mostly with ethnobotanists and uh, anthropologists, but it progressively evolved into this syncretic figure which draws on various native and traditional cultures. And I was quite pleased to hear about the uh, the integration of technology and the naturalism that William Redwood mentions before, exactly because psychonauts um, in the tradition of, uh, say, Terence McKenna, which was one of the first, uh, one of the most famous ones, actually tried to fuse the spiritual and the technological in their own particular science fiction, weird sort and sorcery perspective. They essentially saw the use of psychedelics as something that could enhance one's capacities, give greater insight, and probably uh, solve problems. So today, the figure of the psychonaut, and I decided to use this picture here, which is um, a literal techno shaman who fuses um, <clears throat> technology, psychedelics, and altered states of consciousness to create this kind of new integration, is a direct derivation of these concepts such as weird naturalism, science and science fiction. With weird naturalism, we we're talking about phenomenons such as syncretism, uh, association of, uh, of shapes with events and time frames, which uh, somehow bend the laws of physics. But obviously, within the context of the psychedelic experience, nobody really tries to refute this kind of experience. You just enjoy it within this psychedelic or liminal space for the time being. Another very important element in having a sacred space when it comes to psychedelics, exactly because it is necessary to make the differentiation, which is still quite controversial and under, oops, sorry, which is still controversial and underway on the difference between a psychotic experience and a spiritual experience, the spiritual experience being something willful and controlled, the psychotic experience being something not controlled. Um, I also decided to underline the concept of counterculture, which will also be very important in the structuring of the setting, because as we will see, the setting isn't something as formal as could be found in, let's call it traditionalist ceremonial magic or traditionalist shamanism, although there could be some debate around that, but it has, but it's way more structured around a certain concepts of feeling, emotion, introspection, and intuition, which still, however, have their cognitive guidelines, and we'll go and analyze these later as well. I decided to include, make reference to the vaults of Erud and the DMT nexus, because these are places which, if you wish, 
you can uh, there are collective uh, web pages full of data where you can actually go and find other people's experiments and experiences in their construction of their setting and in the reporting of their set as well which is another fundamental component of the creation of the sacred space which i will sum up which i'll be talking about um, shortly. But one of the things that I wanted to bring your attention to is this book here by Timothy Leary, The Psychedelic Experience, because it's actually in this book that the concept of set and setting, uh, or one of the concepts of set and settings uh, appears for the first time. Although the Tibetan Book of the Dead uh, does provide some kind of information, this is clearly a reinterpretation from the psychedelic perspective, where they give guidelines on how to organize your space, what an appropriate mindset would be, what is probably necessary to gain the best experience or the best uh, effect possible or ideally possible from the use of various substances. Because as a matter of fact, each sacred setting is usually geared or designed to exalt a particular kind of altered state of consciousness and enhance certain particular um, sensory experiences. So, um, as I mentioned before, psychedelics all have different kinds of effects. DMT, for example, which is now becoming very, very popular thanks to the use of the frog. Uh, you can smoke the poisonous substance of this frog and apparently um, the effects of it are so transcendental that one effectively leaves one's body or at least as the perception of leaving one's body and to travel to a different realm usually termed superior or a world of the spirits uh, psilocybin is also frequently used by uh, shamans in mexico uh, ayahuasca which is very very famous now is used by shamans in brazil uh, cannabis usually is uh, is sometimes used but in contemporary esoteric occult contexts. For example, you can find Liber 4, 420, which is both a reference to the 420 number of uh, cannabis, but also to the concept of an old grimoire where you can worship and interact with the spirits of cannabis. And I wanted to include MDMA because although it's not necessarily considered to be a psychedelic as much, but more of an empathogen, it is frequently used in transformational or transcendental festivals and parties because it is supposed to, and uh, within a particular kind of techno music and electronic music context with shamanic overtones, exactly because it's supposed to reproduce the effect of a particular uh, ecstatic dance. Obviously, uh, things such as DMT, which are psychedelically very, very powerful, where you effectively have this level of disassociation of flying out of your body, do require a specific set, which would also imply a babysitter or someone to take care of you, exactly because one loses control of themselves almost completely. And the same thing happens with ayahuasca. And the reason I decided to include these two squares of LSD tabs is because already this idea of the setting is included a little bit in the symbology and the culture that surrounds psychedelics. What is important about this, this represents the bicycle day that was had by Albert Hoffman, who mistakenly took a very, very high dose of LSD, which was something that he was effectively experimenting on. And this happened on two occasions. The second time he was already more interested and were already more experimental. And effectively, he had this absolutely incredible experience while he was riding home on his bike after feeling the first buzz of psychedelics. And he remembers uh, riding around, I think it was probably the city of Bern and having this amazing revelatory experience. And so we have the Swiss Alps here, we have this shift of night and day. And these are very, very representative exactly of one thing that could be an ideal context or an ideal setting, which can effectively be a nature setting or an outdoor setting. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the set at the same time, because uh, the set, which is supposed to be the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the mental state or the education of the practitioner effectively does a lot when it comes to analyzing, feeling, or interpreting a particular context. Most of the times, the psychonauts, which are more spiritually oriented or occult oriented, tend to create a mixture of these particular fields. So 
usually the, uh, the setting will be influenced by these particular fields of research, the psychonauts effectively do uh, use anthropological studies extensively to effectively gain a knowledge on how the proficient traditional shamans would use the psychedelics. And on the basis of the principles of those, they would recreate and interpret new forms of um, new forms of ritual. If I were to make a, a personal example, uh, I had uh, two particular experiences, one with the Church of the Santo Daime and another one which I would consider a more syncretic uh, context. In the first one, there was an effective church, there was a particular set of clothing, an altar, and a particular diet, and there was a certain vision which derived from this, from a syncretic folk Brazilian tradition and Catholicism to a certain extent. Whereas on the other hand, this more new religious movement oriented shaman would use new age music, he would use symbology that was more personal either to himself or to the other people around him, he would use references from the Lord of the Rings, uh, he would, uh, uh, the, 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 this kind of ayahuasca ritual turned partially in a kind of party more than in what a, a conventional religious ritual would be expected to be considered. But as you can see, like the cultural setting would be effectively what the uh, what people, what the general public, not necessarily educated or the media representation would be uh, about, which strongly influences the set, meaning one's personal experience. And the, the set is essentially very, very uh, important in the contribution to the achievement of these peak experiences, which are sometimes associated or linked to Rudolf Soto's uh, Mysterium Tremendus et Fascinans. And the interesting thing is exactly that even your set, depending on the efficiency of the ritual, can effectively change and integrate new ideas, new experiences that are had within this um, religious experience or in this kind of peak experience. But here I wanted to start showing you what some of the effective rituals look like, because we are talking about setting, but obviously the set was very, very, very important to introduce um, the aesthetic designs of the setting. As I mentioned before, uh, we have a syncretism of styles when it comes to psychedelics and psychonautics. We have shamanic rituals, we have occult esoteric rituals. One very famous psychonaut, for example, uses um, if I'm not mistaken, 2CB, which is a new variation of LSD, but it, it was described to me as a more functional LSD, which allows communication while having these powerful visions, whereas LSD apparently doesn't allow you to speak that easily. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Julian Bain used 2CB in, connect, in an attempt to evoke Baphomet, which, however, he reinterprets in a different way than, for example, the Eliphas Levi original creation or the satanic creation. It also creates a synthesis whereby the idea behind it is that uh, Baphomet is supposed to be a representation of the spirit of humanity. And because 2CB is an uninhibitory and exciting drug, where, uh, which at the same time maintains this kind of mystical liminal state, it was considered to be ideal to channel this particular energy. I also included laboratory condition because we must remember that psychonauts are not necessarily, uh, don't necessarily have a, an esoteric framework, but they can frequently be uh, chemists or just ethnobotanists who are experimenting with these substances. And it was done in a laboratory setting exactly because it was supposed to reduce to a minimum all external influences which then turns out to be a bit of a problem because it's exactly the setting that adds the extra magic, so to say, to the psychedelic effect. And this is why we come to the transformational party. And I would bring your attention exactly to this picture. There are plenty of transformational parties around the world. They are commonly associated with this idea of rave culture, which is now being revalued as uh, although rave parties are vastly hedonistically driven, there is a sub-community in them which effectively uses psychedelic substances in this context, and in particular MDMA if it's in relation to music, exactly to create these particular community and empathic altered states of consciousness. If we look, for example, 
at this uh, transformational festival tent. We can already see multiple references to science fiction, esoteric culture, maybe a little bit of conspiracy theory influence. We most clearly have a pyramid. When we come to think about it, there's a lot of lore which considers the pyramid to be this kind of great energy attractor. So people would gather under this tent and somehow participate. As you can see, it's equipped with lights and the stage. And the colors are also very invocative. If we think about the color indigo, it's frequently associated to the third eye chakra. And as you can see, it creates also a game of lights and of shades, which are supposed to create a more suggestive atmosphere while at the same time maintaining this openness because at the same time, there is this desire to create this inclusivity, but openness at the same time. Uh, and, uh, as you can see, even the people are actually dressed with particular colors, which are very, very stimulating to the eye, especially when under the influence of psychedelics, exactly because even looking at your partners or the other people around you, so the effect of other people do become part of the setting, you enter this state of conglomeration and a facilitated fusion through the perception of these colors, which would try and create this idea of wave community. So we already have in this particular case, we're also out in the desert. This can be another cultural reference, the idea of being somehow isolated from urban civilization, going off into the desert, a little bit reminiscent of these ideas of messianic um, revelation, the idea of Jesus going off into the desert, Buddha isolating himself, shamans going off into the jungle. We somehow try to reproduce this kind of idea, albeit collectively, exactly because there is still, so there are still some ideas from counterculture that wanted to create this universalist idea, whereas at the same time maintaining this individuality. Uh, yes, I was actually, I wanted to make a list of the decor that they actually use. And uh, as I said, location can be indoor, outdoor, day or night. Why is this? It's exactly because some substances work better during the day, whereas other substances work better during the night or in hot or in cold climates. For example, psilocybin is particularly useful when one is indoor in front of a fire or effectively under the covers and has that kind of more domestic setting. Whereas if it's cold outside, exactly because the psilocybin is um, to, has a tendency to increase your body temperature and also attack your liver, the moment you're in a cold climate, it somehow greatly reduces the effects of psilocybin. Another, But for example, another reason for maybe doing a substance outdoors, especially in nature, or especially in these more naturalistic evocative places, would allow the practitioner to come more in contact with the concept of ecology and nature specifically, and would be and it would attempt to give a completely different, uh, let's call it religious experience. So, amongst the instruments, obviously magical implements. If these happen to be part of a particular subcultural tradition, so you would say shamanic wands, you would see all these kinds of things, uh, or staffs, or swords, or even just creative mandalas that are there to decorate the whole. Uh, location. I decided I wanted to include pen and paper amongst the instruments as well, exactly because many people find it necessary in their set to actually have something to take notes down, uh, exactly because they get these kinds of uh, revelation and they feel that they have to take down notes so as they can actually use the information to proceed or maybe they receive intuitions exactly during the experience, which will tell them how to move around inside the setting because some parts will be more uh, uh, some parts will be more exciting other parts uh, will maybe be more distracting others will be more relaxing and I will explain it better when I get to a photograph further down costumes are there exactly like I showed you before costumes just create this kind of very very evocative part and very stimulating to uh, very stimulating ideas to creativity and the senses, as much as even food. For example, it, uh, besides the diets that are required as a pre-preparation 
for the creation of a setting exactly to gain as full an experience as it possibly can, but also to put the person into the condition of taking the situation seriously, it is somehow recommended to actually have food present exactly because of snacks, but also because of, because of hunger, but also because certain foods, especially if they're not processed, apparently are, um, can provide this kind of very, very strong, intense and transcendental gastronomic experience. The furniture that have cushions, tents, bean bags, or covers are mostly used exactly to provide this sense of comfort and this sense of weightlessness, exactly because psychedelics can affect the mind in a very, very intense way and make it very, very sensitive to small changes, thus making sure that one has these beds, cushions, tents, covers, bean bags, which do provide this extra sense of relaxation. Um, are always highly recommended. This is uh, this is more of a construction of a of a comfortable space uh, more than effectively the creation of a religious space. Music is again another way of uh, attracting the senses, and there are various forms of music that are used for, uh, for example, uh, techno music or psychedelic psy trance music, which is specifically designed, apart from anything else, for these particular kinds of settings and ultimately there's also religious objects as i mentioned before depending on one's taste one's background and one's inclination the psychonauts will use all kinds of statues statuettes depending on what they want to summon depending on what they want to come in contact with or depending on whether they have a personal connection to that object in particular these are simply photographs that I wanted to show you that depict a little bit what I wanted to talk about before. As you can see here, we have this syncretic, uh, semi-Tibetan, semi-hippie um, context with candles in the middle and all these fur skins. Usually settings like these want to go more uh, native or say romantically native. These situations would be more designated to say summon the spirits of the ancestors to come more into contact with this idea of the ancestors. Now, of course, our culture doesn't necessarily reflect what is happening here, but the inspiration drawn or this kind of postmodern reinterpretation or cultural absorption, which was part of the counterculture and uh, the psychonautic uh, subculture effectively led to the creation of situations like these. As you can see, instead of techno music here, they would tend to use this repetitive drumming to summon the spirits. You would have the bare fur skin so you can effectively lie around and somehow imitate or reenact this um, romantic shamanic spiritual idea. And another thing that I found very, very interesting is exactly how people tend to dispose themselves exactly in group rituals. There is a lot to this idea of the formation of the circle, because uh, it does provide this sense of connected unity, this sense of alliance, and this sense of intimacy, and this concept of sharing. And obviously, you would have various layers. The most experienced people would be here at the center, with the onlookers being outside. And it's, it's very similar to this other one, if you come to think about it. Here you are effectively trying to create a connection amongst people. You're trying to create a sense of fraternization. Whereas this instead, as you can see, is way closer to this rock cult, uh, concert or this psychedelic psytrance concert. The decor is way more close to this technological trippy ideas as, a, as opposed to the more traditional shamanic ones. Here, nobody is in a circle, for example. Everybody's looking or is focusing their attention towards one particular object, which, well, in this case, is clearly the camera, but we would imagine that there would be something to follow or an icon or a symbol, because being able to, to be within a structure, within, an, within a recent, reasonably organized structure, facilitates the use of the psychedelic substances exactly because they can be highly, highly, highly disorienting being in a circle and having other cognitive points of reference can be an incredible aid, especially for the prevention of falling into bad trips or the development of negative emotions. So, uh, as I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the purposes for this, um, for the creation of a proper setting. And normally it's a question of distraction, relaxation of focus. Why did I put these here? It's exactly because as in most 
as in other mystical traditions, one of the main problems is effectively resolving the chatting voice inside one's head, which tends to constantly analyze and is not necessarily under our control. So one of the things that it did not include actually as part of the setting for the less religious oriented setting is the use of video games, which I have found in more than one trip report. It's exactly because maybe in this in the context of the set, we start to create expectations. These expectations can strongly influence the effect of the drug and whereby playing with a video game will remove the mind from that particular activity or reading a book or getting into bed. The focus part instead comes from what I showed you in the previous case, which is this one here. A focus is also very, very necessary. Sometimes uh, lone psychonauts, I didn't include them here because it was more interesting to show a group ritual than a personal one. Personal rituals tend to be relatively boring. It has more to do with sitting in front of uh, a statue, maybe taking some kind of substances and entering in a state of meditation. It becomes something very, very personal. But the focus can be aided by, for example, candles or something like incense, which will be a point of reference to always go back to and reachieve some kind of stability uh, when maybe confronted exactly with uh, some kind of bad or more complex part of the trip. And this is exactly how we get back to the reference points that I was mentioning before, shapes are effectively reference points. They're pillars that you can always go back to. They create safe spaces within the sacred space. And obviously, uh, sensory control and stimulation are big parts of uh, any kind of setting. Exactly the disposition of certain points will tend to bring one's mind back to certain concepts, to certain ideologies, and to certain uh, frameworks. But universalism, as I probably mentioned before, is one of the core points of psychedelic um, of psychedelic uh, rituals, and um, and and uh, there is this tendency to try and expand one's consciousness beyond one's ordinary limits. And this actually led me finally to a question, which I would probably like to discuss which is exactly this about liminal states and the concept of what can we really consider to be a uh, sacred space and can the sacred space be broken exactly to transcend and become effectively universal. Now, why did I bring this photograph here? Because this is a liminal state room. What does it mean? It's that one can effectively go there and have a sensory deprivation experience which would be very, very similar to that of a psychedelic experience, but not necessarily with the use of drugs. The sensory deprivation, as you probably know, even with sensory deprivation chambers, can also lead to these altered states of consciousness, which by, exactly, by um, sensory stimulation or its suppression, exactly to, to achieve these altered states of consciousness. And this is considered to be one of the optimal places in which to do it. As you can see, we have individual chairs, but there is a collectivity. So you are not necessarily alone in this experience. There would be a person here dedicated to the controlling of the situation. And these three curtains are actually there effectively to create this sense of separateness, this effect of bizarrity, which is very evocative. We have these strong contrasting colors, which are meant to be there to both calm and excite the mind at the same time, which is what frequently happens under the effects of um, psychedelics. And the thing was that that led me to the, uh, to the final question is, can we really talk about sacred spaces when there is a, such a giant expansion of consciousness? Because for me, it seems it appears more that the sacred space within the case of psychedelics has more to do with the protection of one's physical body rather than a particular conceptualization of how the world works. Exactly, because frequently on psychedelics, you have this idea that one's consciousness expands to the whole universe, whereas the body just stays uh, where it is. And at that point, I thought, well, at this point, if we have all these ideas of nature being sacred, all these places of being sacred, can we really talk about sacred spaces or and uh, and it also led me to the conceptualization of the construction of these 
sacred spaces exactly because under in cases of LSD, one of the first things or one of the most frequent things that tends to fall is exactly this kind of social barrier. And if you want to conceptualize a sacred space exactly as a constructed separate social element, we might maybe see it as not as something sacred, but not necessarily permanently sacred, more of a launching pad to expand this concept of sacredness to one's um, surrounding, which is also very reminiscent of many uh, spiritual ideas or many magical ideas that we can find in various uh, texts from the past. So for now, I just wanted to present uh, the setting or the sacred setting exactly because even from different, um, even though from different backgrounds, many of these psychonauts do tend to acquire this sense of the sacred, or better still, this sense of the meaningful with sacred attributes, which um, which leads them to see, which leads them to, if not consider sacred, at least to consider settings very important, if not fundamental, to an appropriate handling of psychedelics meaning in the proper steering towards a psychedelic or transcendental or luminous experience. And I think that I've more or less come to the end of my slides and also the end of my allotted time. So thank you very much to everyone for having patiently listened to me talk about all these uh, bizarre locations. Thank you very much.